really uh, privileged to be here and I hope you are enjoying your stay in Israel and we start the second day of uh, this forum. Uh, my name is Aran and I am the professional director of the legal clinics at the law faculty here. Four and a half years ago, a right-wing organization na named Im Tirzu published a report regarding the legal clinics in Haifa as part of his monitoring of different parts of the academia in Israel. The report was, to say the least, inaccurate and extremely biased, and it uh, attacked different aspects of our work, including representing Arab citizens or working in cooperation with human rights organizations like the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, or ADALA, the Legal Center for Arab, Arab Minority Rights in Israel. I'm pointing Hassan because he's the head of Adala. Uh, the issue which caught the eye of the media and the Israeli parliament was the fact that our prison rights clinic represented, in five different cases, security prisoners, meaning prisoners in prison for security violation. In various aspects of prisoner rights, like rehabilitation, visits, prisoner education, and access to books. While from my perspective, educating students about the importance of human rights is mandatory, part of the public and the current govern government sees cer certain human rights activism as a side with the enemy. <coughs> as a result, there is a lot of pressure placed on academia to avoid issues that are so-called political and to confirm with gov government political views. At the same time, there have been several I uh, initiatives from the different branches of the go government aimed at regulating the academia while limiting academic freedom. We also see this kind of political pressure on attorneys working for the state to walk in line with the current government political views about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, even when this interferes with their understanding of the law. The role of lawyers in the near future will be more challenging. The rules of a, a belligerent occupation or military occupation which guides Israeli legal system must be challenged, as it be becoming impossible to view the occupation of the West Bank as temporary, both in reality and in the vision of Israeli government. This kind of issues ra raise questions concerning the role of the legal education vis-a-vis -vis, uh, to the pro uh, protracted conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Which kind of legal education should be given in the academia, and are we fulfilling this vision? It is, it, is it possible to avoid the legal, moral, and political debate concerning human rights in the occupied territories? And assuming it is impossible to teach human rights, international law, and democratic theory without touching upon, upon these issues, how can law schools steer these cont uh, controversial issues? Which kind of lawyers do we want to see in the rooms where the de decisions about the conflict are made? What is the role of academia in general and the law faculties specifically to promote justice and human rights? And it, is it possible to take this during such a conflict? Now, I will let our speakers to answer this easy uh, question. Um, 10 minutes for each, and then we'll open this discussion for everyone. Uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Immanuel Gross from Haifa University. Uh, we specialize in military law, law and morality, evidence, criminal procedure, criminal law, and law and terrorism. Immanuel. Well, first of all, good morning. I am uh, privileged to return to my home, Haifa. I'm a retired professor, so this is a unique visit uh, to uh, my home. Um, a few, a few uh, things about, uh, words about uh, uh, my biography. Uh, actually, I spent 25 years before joining the, Acadi uh, the uh, uh, Academia, I spent at the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, as a military judge. Uh, so I had, uh, you know, the, the, the privilege, uh, if you want, uh, to know the, the facts on the ground. Uh, I had to uh, try many, uh, many trials of, uh, of uh, people, uh, Palestinian people that were uh, uh, indicted, accused with, with uh, terror terrorism. 
And then uh, after uh, finishing my military service, I was joined the Haifa University when, at, at the beginning, at, at more than 20 years ago, um, I'm one of the founders of this uh, new faculty. And I try to contribute to my students, you know, my experience, uh, pr pr the, my <coughs> practical experience about how to, uh, to deal with, with the uh, problems uh, that on the ground that we were facing uh, during our uh, em emergency times in Israel and uh, the occupied ter territories. I would like to take you uh, to uh, some uh, some uh, words that that uh, my mentor, Professor Aaron Barak, ah, who actually okay. friend, mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he he actually brought me to Haifa University. It was his uh, good advice mm -hmm. uh, to 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 get here. And when I published uh, my book on the struggle of uh, democracy against terrorism, he was kind enough, you know, to wrote some introduction. Mm -hmm. And I would like to share with you the, the, the main concept that uh, uh, he holds on, on how, how to balance the conflicts uh, of the needs of security against the, the preserving human rights. A concept that I'm also uh, sharing, uh, accepting, uh, uh, and le let me take you, you know, to, to the words he used, uh, he, he s and I'm qu quoting, this gu guidance is based on three fundamental concepts. Uh, he speaks about the struggle uh, or, or the war against uh, terrorism. Uh, the first uh, concept is the, the struggle against terror cannot be conducted outside the law. The, the struggle against terror must be waged within the law, using the tools that the law makes avail <coughs> available to a democratic state. This is what distinguishes the state from terrorists. The state operates within the boundaries of law. Terrorists contravene the law. The struggle against terrorism, terrorism is, therefore, the struggle of the law against those who rise up against, against it. The statement attributed to Cicero to the fact that in times of war, the laws fall silent, reflects, says Barak, reflects neither reality nor what is desirable. The second uh, uh, concept principle is, uh, says Barak, the normative framework was established on the basis that a, de a democracy fight against terrorism must be grounded on the dedicated balance between the need uh, to preserve the safety of the state and its citizens and the need to safeguard human dignity and liberty. This balance is based on the need to find a, a synthesis be between conflict values and principles. This balance must be in the nature of things on a appropriate restriction, both on the fighting force of the democratic state <coughs> and on the free freedom of the individual. An appropriate balance is not maintained when state security is fully protected as if human rights do not exist. In a democracy fight against terrorism, not every measure is permissible. Often a democracy will fight with one hand tied behind its back. An appropriate balance is not maintained when human rights um, are fully protected as if terrorism does not exist. Human rights are not a platform for national destruction. Third, the courts are available, available to decide conflicts relating to the state struggle against terrorism. When, in, when it uh, is uh, contended that, that, that human rights have been infringed, there is no room to close the doors of the court. When a law exists by virtue of which war is waged against terror, a court exists that will de determine what is uh, permissible and what is prohibited. Well, those were the words of uh, Barack. <coughs> I agree fully with uh, those words. 
not in not only in uh, this book but uh, rather in my other uh, many other articles that uh, I try to uh, discuss the, the many aspects of the struggle against terrorism by the democratic state I I I always remember that in the, that what I try to you know to teach my students that we we, we should remember that we are a dem democratic state and as such we have uh, of course uh, the obligation uh, that, that to, to defend our citizens but we have also to preserve uh, our uh, basic values as a, a democratic state human rights is uh, one of the core of uh, what uh, makes a, a state to be a, de a democratic a, de a democracy therefore we have to always to, to look and to find out uh, the, 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 the just and the right balance between the needs of security on the one and the and pres preservation of human rights on the other end. That what I was uh, doing all my years, uh, that I'm, uh, what I'm teaching, I was teaching, still teaching my students. Uh, of course, it's not that simple to find the formula uh, how to do it uh, on a practical uh, uh, basis, but uh, when you are looking at the, the rulings of our uh, Supreme Court, you'll uh, see that th they, they, they succeeded uh, to find a way to uh, bring about the needs of security and to preserve human rights on the other end. So, the, for example, the, the High Court of Justice, our High Court of Justice was, uh, was not, never hesitate, you know, to stop the army. Stop the army and said, well, take down the fence, security fence, because it was, uh, it, it, it was uh, put on, 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 the, on a route that is not taking enough human rights in consideration. So, do it again. Um, so, no, that to, to change the track in some area. In some area, yeah. Okay. Uh, it was only a small example. Where I have many other examples uh, uh, as well. But this is the the, the, the main thing to, to uh, that the I think that characterized Israel, the ability to defend itself. And on the other end, you know, to preserve, trying to, to uh, not forgetting that we are not terrorists. We are the democracy. We should uh, uh, preserve our basic values and bring uh, as much as we can, you know, to, to achieve this. Thing. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Rit Khan. Uh, for 10 years, was the director of the International Division in the State Attorney Office and a neighbor of mine when I worked there. And the last eight years, she is in the president of the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, and also she teach in the Bailano University. Well, so first of all, in order to be transparent, I'm not anymore the president ah. of the International Association since November, and I'm not teaching anymore in Bailano. Ah. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so I, will, uh, I, I will tell you, first of all, I ask myself, what do we really want in this conference? When I read the subject, it was not clear to me. And, uh, but because since I was very young and I studied law, and I won't tell you how many years ago, you can guess, uh, I always saw the legal profession as having near it obligation. And it's interesting because I read about it, you know, before you come to a conference with such professors, you know, I'm not a professor, I'm not from the academia, you have to learn more about this thing. And I've seen that there was a lot of writing, and actually, lately, books, that saying that while you take the legal profession, you take obligation with you. You're coming to society with an obligation. Now, to speak about the obligation in a legal society, it's completely why do we think that there is another obligation? Because people that are people that contradict it, they say, well, you go, you study law, you go and work in law, and that's it. But uh, this is a different thing. I'm coming out from the point of view that I think that people that are studying law has an obligation in society when they come out as lawyers. 
uh, we can discuss about it, but I don't want to stay on this because I want to go to the subject that uh, we are talking today. Uh, after being uh, 10 years uh, uh, in the international department uh, that uh, I was the head of the international department, I decided that I accumulate so much uh, knowledge about extradition because this was the main thing in this uh, department, legal assistance and extradition, that I wanted to teach. And two universities, Bailan University and the College of Management, approached me and asked me if I would be able to bring practic practical law into the classes. And this was my, uh, it was very interesting three years when I had the uh, the contact with the students, which I really try to show them uh, about law that we don't have black and white. We are studying law in the university and we learn how to interpret it, the law, how to work in the law, but when it comes afterward <coughs> to do it, I'll give you just a, a, a small example that it's not a, a question of human right, but there was a case in Israel uh, about a probation officer that the United States asked for his extradition, and the offense was that he tried to put his uh, home on fire in order to get the, uh, the restitution from the insurance company. And the evidence that we got in order to extradite him was people that we took care of, because he was a probation officer, people that came out of prison that uh, he used to, to work with them. And there was a statement from these people who said that uh, that what happened. Now, sometimes when you work, you have intuition, you develop intuition. And when I saw this guy, I knew that it's not true. You, know, you ask me, it's like, it's very not academic to say it, but when I saw the way that he expressed himself, that those guys were, because he put them back in prison, etc., they had something against him, so they, that, that's what they did. So here, me, from the prosecuting, we have to extradite him. I have all the material, because we need prima facie evidence. We don't need more than this. We are not trying to see if the evidence is right or wrong. So what do I do? So I approached him, which is maybe not done because I was a defense lawyer, and maybe the defense lawyer want to make money and to have as, as much as we can, you know, meetings in the court, etc. And I told him, I believe you. Do as well. Go back to the States immediately. Don't waste your time here, because at the end of the time, you'll be extradited because of the other material. And prove in the United States what you did. And he did. And he was acquitted. And I remember that the lawyer that, uh, uh, that was, it was Danny Scheinman, that was representing him, called me afterward. He said, Irit, thank you so much. So I try to bring it to the class to show them that it's not that you would like to succeed. Because I could say, ah, wonderful, I would go to court, I will develop it in court, and then I will extradite him, and I was, you know, I was successful, etc. I tried to show them as much as I could between the cases I used to divide them to, uh, to prosecution and to the defense, and try to, to bring up the practical thing of the law. From the beginning, the question between Arab Israelis and Israelis was always very, very important to me. So I can give you a, a, an example that when I was the president of the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists, I approached judge uh, from the Supreme Court. You know what his name? Jubran. And I told him, I think that as lawyers, because in my background, I have the feeling of the uh, something, our obligation as lawyers to do something good in society, we should meet, we should establish a group of Israeli Jewish lawyers and, and uh, Israeli Arab lawyers. And we work together on human rights. We'll try to do, first of all, we'll start on the thing that we agree, because it's, it's very sensitive, the whole thing. And we did. We established a group of Israeli lawyers and uh, Arab Israeli lawyers in the president's house. And it was very, it, we had so much hope that it will work. It was like seven uh, Arab lawyers and maybe seven or eight Israeli lawyers. There was no Jewish, Jewish lawyers, exactly. <laughs> and um, 
and uh, there were no women at the Arab group, which made me think, but were women in the uh, Israeli Jewish lawyers. And we finished, and it was, and the president talked, uh, he was so <coughs> excited about the whole idea. And what happened next? And this I have to tell you. We tried to get this group together numerous times, and we were not successful. So I went back to Judge Juban, and I told him, I said, I really want to work with this group. I think that it's such a wonderful thing that we will, they will bring their friends, we will bring our friends. We were not successful. I talked to our members in the Knesset who were not successful. I don't know why. Every time that we tried to make a meeting or something like this, it didn't come out, not because of us, because we really wanted to come. So this is something that maybe we'll talk about it, discuss it afterward, because I think that it's a platform to work and to do a fantastic job. So this was like my working with the uh, Arab lawyers during this now, talking uh, about uh, university <coughs> students. My daughter was a director <coughs> of a group that called Equator. I don't know, maybe you know her. Equator is a group that decided to bring Arab Israeli academies to the academia. And they teach them how to interview, because it's different culture many times, and the language, etc. And uh, they brought not only to <coughs> the academia to, to find for them job, because it was taken, they, they usually took the good, the good students that finished the law, and to find for them a lawyer's offices in, in order to make their apprentice. It was not easy. Now, I talked a lot about with my uh, daughter before I was coming here. And uh, she's very much known, she's really well known and established with the knowledge about the students. Now, University of Haifa, as you all know, has 30% of Arab students which I think could be a fantastic platform to work together on human rights. No question about it in human rights. Now, my daughter told me, and she's right, she said, Mother, you have to understand, students that are coming from uh, Jewish students are coming after the army. Sometimes they are going abroad, coming with a view more, more like a I won't say uh, all, they are older, more mature. but more mature and more established in, in, in their opinion. Arab students are coming, sometimes they're leaving their house for the first time. Hebrew is not so strong with them, and uh, the culture is a little bit different. So in order to be able to talk about human rights and to bring those two groups together, there is to be a lot of work, maybe one year before, to help the Arab students. But what I heard here is that you don't see meeting, there is a segregation like between the Arab students and the, Isra the Arab students and the Israeli Jewish students, the Israeli Arab students. And this is something that is taking away hope in my eyes. I think that if we could take those two groups together, call, call the, the course human rights, whatever. Start talking to each other. Bring, a, bring the problems of each group and start hearing. This could be a basic afterward to a future hope in the dispute. Look, I was born into the dispute. And I hope that before I close my eyes, I will see a solution. I'm not sure about it. But this is something that all of us, I'm talking about these people that here, and I think that most of the people in Israel really would love to see. And I, and I think that the Israeli Arabs is really a fantastic power to work together. We see them today in the hospitals, in all kinds of, all, there are better ones, they are like, exactly like the Jewish society. But I think that if we start, especially in the legal faculty, bringing those two groups together and help the, the Israeli Arabs, I think that we really could uh, achieve very good things. Just one more thing. Uh, 
Yael, my daughter, had in her group in the equator 50% Israeli Jews and 50% Israeli Arabs. And they were working, all of them, the target was, they wanted to achieve the target to bring those uh, young Arabs that finished the university to find the jobs and to, and to lo all kind of uh, offices, etc. And I asked her, I said, Yael, how did it work? How did it work when we had uh, the Gaza conflict, you know? And she said, at the beginning, everyone was working just to, with a goal of bringing the young Arabs. When something like this happened, so she remembered that one of the girls said, my cousin was uh, wounded in Aza in his leg. And the <coughs> other girl that was an Arab girl, Khir, if you know her, so she didn't say anything. So the other girl was very offended. You know, here I'm telling you that uh, my cousin was hurt. <coughs> and Khir said, well, uh, you know, when there are so many people uh, killed there and uh, your cousin uh, was hurt in the leg, I uh, didn't find uh, any need uh, the way that I felt to say it. So they started to talk to each other. And at the end of the day, they brought two people, an Arab and Israeli, and they sat in this group and they found many things that are common and many things that <coughs> separated them, but they found a common language. And that's what I think that in the university, I would help you if you would like to do it in the University of Haifa, without money, <coughs> <coughs> finish my, my thesis. I, because I really feel that I could do it. I decided that after I finished the Ministry of Justice and the job now, I would like to work in the area of the Israeli Arabs and the and uh, as Israeli Jewish people, a population. But I think that Haifa is a fantastic place because Haifa has the biggest, but by the way, the, the segregation, as my daughter told me, it's unfortunately, it's in most of the universities that we see like legal students. Today, of course, we have the legal clinics, etc. That's something that never been in my time, you know, we were wanted, we wanted to do something <coughs> else. But this is my view when I think about the legal profession and legal students. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll pass for, uh, to Hassan Jabari, uh, the chairman of Adala, the legal center for Arab minority rights in Israel. He won many awards for his work for human rights. He's a long time teacher in Tel Aviv. He also was my teacher 20 years ago, I think, when uh, I was a student. <laughs> Maybe we'll hear some critics about his views of uh, yeah the legal system and the studies in Israel. Yeah, uh, good morning uh, everybody and thank you for inviting me. <coughs> uh, one of uh, the unique thing of studying uh, law in Israel is uh, that this is almost the only country in the world uh, that at the same time you must study in order to understand the law the IHL, the International Humanitarian Law, and at the same time to study constitutional law as two major studies in order to understand what the law is in this country. In fact, Israeli Supreme Court is the only Supreme Court in the world. And for a long time, for more than 40 years, at the same time, the same panel, at the same day, they can hear case about the right of Israeli citizens within the constitutional law framework, and minute after or one hour after, the same panel will hear case about the applicability of international humanitarian law when they deal with cases referring to the Palestinian live under the occupation. And sometimes this two different categories, one constitutionalism, one IHR. Sometimes also they are mixed. When the court has to hear cases of Israeli settlers who live in the occupied territories, they have to hear, in this case, Israeli constitutionalism and IHL at the same time. So if we look to <coughs> the law schools, 
first question I will ask whether the graduated students they will know when they leave uh, when they are graduate uh, this connection between Israeli constitutionalism and IHO to which degree they have enough knowledge about that now about Israeli constitutionalism uh, although uh, the law schools in Israel are open uh, generally we can say consider relatively to the Israeli society liberal and in, as Haran said that even sometime right wing attack extreme right wing attack some of the uh, courses that are taught in the Israel law school but also the Israel constitutionalism is limited and in somehow very conservative in the study of the law school in Israel. First of all, we'll start with the question that I think that American students will know when they study uh, American constitution, many cases about we the people and how it was framed, and how, to, how it was developed, what the relevant cases of this definition. In fact, with the study, any case about discrimination, it tackle in one way or other the notion of we the people, even if they study in the legal history of constitutionalism or, or today, how it was evolved. So this concept, the, the constitutional identity, is the major matter of studying uh, constitutionalism. Now in Israel, Israel defined itself as Jewish and democratic state within the Green Line, within not the occupied territories in Israel. So what's that mean from understanding the constitutional identity of Israel? Now that mean, based on Israel Supreme Court decision, that Israel is the state for Jewish people only. That means that the law of return which is the basic of citizenship, will be applied only for Jews. No one <coughs> except Jews in the world will enjoy that. Even if you are Palestinian citizen of Israel, you don't have family unification, right of family unification, like American Jewish person who decided to be Israel citizen. He will have, be Israeli citizen. And if his wife or the spouse a non-Jewish person, <coughs> also they will have the right to immigrate and to be citizens. So here we have serious problem of defining who is citizen. Second, also the meaning of Jewish and democratic state mean that Israel must keep Jewish democracy. The uh, Jewish majority in Israel must. Not that we describe that in this state there are Jewish majority. The Israel state must keep it, meaning to take all the efforts to keep Jewish majority. To take all the effort to keep Jewish majority, that means the Palestinian citizen of Israel is a problem. Because he's not the Jewish and the state must work to balance his existence. And other factors in cultural rights like the Jewish state means dominant of Jewish cultural rights dominant in the language as Hebrew and other aspects. Now this is a major matter about the concept of we the people. The question that I ask, despite the richness of the legal writing in Israel, despite the fact that there are at least 10 journals, legal journals in Israel, in Hebrew, that they are published. And despite the openness, is there one article, legal article, written by a Jewish Israeli person, which criticized the notion of Israel being Jewish and democratic state? My answer is no. There is no one article. So here, in fact, the main aspect of conflict or dispute between the two groups in the Green Line, Palestinian citizen 
of Israel, and the Jewish citizens of Israel. What makes them different, not how they look, and not their culture. In fact, sometimes you don't know, in this law school, you don't know who is law, Arab law students, or who is Jewish student from their look, or address, or behavior, or manner. You cannot know. Even in the language, if they speak to you. Sometimes the uh, uh, Hebrew of the Arab students better than the Jewish student, in many cases. <coughs> so what makes them different? What makes them different? that Israeli Jewish students are Zionist, and the Palestinian students are not Zionist, and say Zionism won't treat us equally. We are not equal citizens because the notion of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Now, this is a major matter between the students. And the law school don't take it seriously. And they don't teach about it. The, a critique. They will teach you why Israel defines itself as Jewish and democratic state. What is the justification for them? And you will find the most liberal Zionist philosopher, legal philosopher in the country defending this notion and give justification to that. But there is no critique. The only critique that you will find people like me. If the first article that was written in any Israel legal journal in Hebrew against this notion was mine in 2000. And the second one was mine. And the third one was with other person. His name is uh, uh, relevant to my name. His name uh, Yusuf Jabarin. Now he is a member of the Knesset. And another one. This is what you found. So here we have a problem in teaching what makes citizen citizen? What makes citizen citizen is citizenship. We don't study it. We don't teach it. Now, another aspect about IHL. Uh, as uh, my uh, colleagues, two colleagues spoke before me, uh, Erit and Amanuel, uh, all Israeli students come after the army. and all the professors of the law school after the army. You are entering a space, all of them serve in the army. Imagine you enter the law school, Yale Law School, or any of the law school here. You, I will tell you, you are entering law school. Everybody serve in the army or serving in the army. Everybody has one person who was injured in war or killed in war relative or he or she killed or injured others so this is by itself give serious limitation of studying international humanitarian law. studying international humanitarian law under occupation is the critique against the army in any country in the world because IHL came to limit the power of the army or to tell us what the legal framework of the army that they have to live with it. Is Israel a st legal student when they graduate? No, IHL, no. There are courses, but they are voluntary courses. And how is the teaching of the IHL? The teaching of the IHL in Israel law school, generally speaking, is that you take landmark cases of the Israeli Supreme Court, analyze them, and ignore thousands of cases that some of them are published, some of them are unpublished, and you take the landmark cases in order to study the general rules. Because landmark cases tell us what the general law is. And this is why the focus here. So generally, there are very few. You can uh, say there are, cannot reach 20 cases, the landmark cases, I mean. But you teach them with less critique. I mean, we'll mention, for example, the cases of the war. How they are taught. 
ICJ, the International Court of Justice, criticized the building of the wall as such. And they say it violates the right because you build it with it inside uh, the <coughs> West area and Gaza. Inside the West Bank, Jerusalem is occupied territory. You build it inside Jerusalem. West Bank is occupied territory. The wall inside and divide the area to to high degree. Now this decision came before the decisions of Israeli Supreme Court, the major decisions. The Israeli Supreme Court had to give answer to the ICJ. They say the decision, we agree with all the principles of ICJ, but we disagree with the facts. The facts, they were not brought before the ICJ because Israel decided to boycott the hearing. But the facts referring to the security. And ICJ didn't take security of Israel seriously. We take it, and this is why the war is legitimate. We apply the same principles, but in the proportional test, we find that security is a matter here. So the wall is legitimate. But we are ready, in some time, in the name of the proportional test, to change the track of the wall if damage Palestinian families. So for example, if the wall come and cut school in East Jerusalem, it's unfair to cut the school to two sides. The track could be switched a couple of meters and to cover. Now you have some of the cases that they were accepted like that, and those are the landmark cases. Why landmark cases? Because they emphasize the human rights of the families or the schools, that they are damaged. But the big question should be to study this, how the court, and the, question, the relevant question here is not that the court accepted those cases, but how the court legitimized the accusation. And this is the focus of the case. The court defending the most, the result part of the army, building the wall, give its legitimacy, and at the same time, it convey a message that we are defending human rights. So the question is just about legitimacy. Do the Israeli legal school teach that from this perspective? No. The students got out, and they repeat what Anwar read about what the Aaron Barak said. We have beautiful Supreme Court that defend the human rights. And of course, Aaron Barak will say, the law must apply even in those cases. Because the law is becoming a machine for legitimacy, legitimation. This is why the Israeli Supreme Court deal with those cases. And this is why you find many Israeli legal professors will say, we are the only Supreme Court in the world that they are ready to examine the act of the armies within military regime. No one would, yes, in order to legitimize it. And this is what we found. Last comment I want to say. Israeli universities generally are open. You have freedom of expression, good freedom of academy in many departments, in most of the departments. No one was fired because his or her legal opinion. I teach here. I am allowed to say all my opinion. And I say that, and I have a discussion with the student. But if we compare the law schools in Israel to other departments, say political science, say sociology, <coughs> the other departments beyond the law schools, they teach now question whether Israel, the relevant framework of Israel regime is colonialism or ethnocracy or this is just incubation regime because you have the longest incubation in the world and half of the society and there is a law, half of the society in this country live under incubation. But the law school didn't reach the question 
of colonialism. There is no one article to discuss whether colonialism is framework relevant, whether incubation regime as all the regime is relevant, or ethnocracy is relevant. The only relevant framework that you study, Jewish and democratic state. So here are the law schools comparing to Israeli laws, uh, Israeli other academic departments is very, very concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it raised a question what we can expect from legal system if the change can come from legal system or from the political framework. Uh, our next speaker, I saw she had a lot to say, to say so write a lot. Pnina uh, Sharvit Baruch, a senior research associate at the Institute of, uh, for National Security Studies. She was uh, for 20 years and five years as the head of the department of the International Law Department in the Army. Uh, one of the specialists in this kind of studies of the international law in Israel, and she teaches also in Tel Aviv. Pnina, so as you read, I, I taught in Tel Aviv University. I taught three years uh, the international law. After I retired, I was for 20 years in the IDF. And then I taught uh, two years a seminar on the legal aspects of the Israeli Arab or Israeli Palestinian conflict. Um, and I was planning to speak about one thing, but I'll speak about <laughs> So I, I, I want to speak a little bit about my uh, point of view, but I will try to refer to the, to the points that are very, uh, I think, the most central that were raised by uh, Advocate Jabarin, or Professor Jabarin. Um, and uh, so just a, I will start a little bit with my history. I joined the IDF. I, was, uh, I studied law in Tel Aviv University. I was in what we call the academic reserve. So I started the first day uh, I went to university, and then I joined the military. Uh, and I joined the international law department in 1989, and I was there until 2009 in the same department. I was the head of the department from 2003, was a deputy quite a few years beforehand. Um, and in this capacity, um, when I started, uh, I was uh, in charge of uh, the department. As part of the department, we were in charge of giving all the legal advice on the rules of uh, the laws of occupation. Um, all areas uh, of the uh, West Bank and the Gaza Strip were under um, the responsibility of the military commander and the civil administration. So I was in charge of li giving legal advice on uh, taxation and insurance, say, uh, on uh, civil issues. But we were also dealing with the uh, intifada, and uh, was the uprising. So there were a lot of detainees. I was also responsible on issues regarding detention, uh, uh, so security measures, and also civilian issues. Um, but since 1993, even starting 91, let's say, in the, the Madrid conference, but more since 1993, after the declaration of principles, the Oslo process, I was a member of the uh, delegations on uh, the negotiations with the Palestinians, and I continued in all tracks of <coughs> negotiations as long as I was in the military until uh, 2005, the disengagement. Uh, beforehand, uh, of course, all the interim agreement, the Gaza Jericho agreement, and the interim agreement, the Y agreement, the Bron, Y, Sharem, Camp David uh, discussions. Uh, so that was what I did. For 10 years, I was, uh, that was my life, uh, <laughs> negotiating and uh, trying to reach peace. Hope we were really very hopeful. Um, it didn't happen. Um, and then from the end of uh, 2000, beginning of 2001, uh, mainly from 2001, uh, we started being uh, uh, involved uh, less in peace and more in war. I would say that it's like Tolstoy in the my, my career, instead of war and peace, was peace and war. So we started involved in a war, and in a, since we had the second intifada, which was not an intifada so much, it was much more violent, uh, and the clashes, and uh, uh, the idea was outside the uh, major cities, so when there were uh, armed elements there, and there was fighting, and the level was very high. So there was a question of what is the legal framework that applies to these clashes we were having in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And we were asked also as the legal advisors uh, to give our input of what can and cannot be done, not so much what is the law that was less, or what is the legal regime, but what can we or can't we do as the, as the IDF? Can we, for example, use the Air Force? Can we bomb uh, certain military objectives or certain uh, uh, heads of uh, the military groups or terrorists? Yes or no? We had to come up with the answers. Um, and then we defined the situation as uh, an armed conflict. Uh, my then, uh, I was a deputy then, so Daniel Reisner was, uh, he said, armed conflict short of war, 
it's stuck, although I don't know what is armed conflict short of war, because armed conflict is just a modern term for war, but that was the terminology, because we were afraid to say war, we said it's not exactly war. And then we developed the, what, the targeting, the whole concept of targeted killing was actually developed in our department, and we had a, a this was in 2001, a, uh, I will say this all about the committee of senators that came from the U.S. Um, to uh, examine what's happening, and they, uh, then they came back and they wrote a report that what we're doing is uh, unlawful because there's no such thing as an armed conflict against terrorists, terrorists or uh, criminals, and they have to be uh, prosecuted, and uh, you can't have wage war against terrorists, and you can't use uh, the laws of armed conflict. This was, of course, the middle of 2001. And then after 9-11, uh, we saw a change in the U.S. position, in other countries' position. We, then I was one of my trips was to the U.S., to JFCOM, to teach them about how we uh, uh, developed uh, our legal concept. So we saw also a transition in the world. And what, what, but in, personally, what we were involved was in giving legal advice. We were really struggling with learning and uh, applying the rules, but we we never went to the position that the U.S. took in the beginning that there are no relevant rules because this is not exactly the classic uh, armed conflict. We said the armed conflict, the IHL applies in all kinds of armed conflicts, even if it's not against the state, even if it's in occupied territory. Uh, we will apply uh, uh, the uh, rules and we will have to, but we have to apply them in a way uh, IHL is a living body of rules and the rules as any law have to apply to the fact, we will apply them uh, in a way that, uh, that they work with the facts. Um, and, uh, and this uh, actually uh, was uh, how we became involved in give, giving uh, the commanders uh, advice on uh, uh, all operational issues. Uh, it developed with time. Uh, afterwards, we had the Second Lebanon War, and then cast lead, uh, and then other operations. My last one was cast lead. I retired immediately after that. It was uh, the end of two December 2008, January 2009. And uh, by that time, we had legal advisors uh, in all levels, from the ministerial level and uh, general chief of staff level down to the division level. We don't have, we didn't have, and we still don't have legal advisors in the uh, brigade level and down. Um, giving uh, legal advice also before uh, in the preparations uh, on uh, operational plans, on targets, target banks, uh, means and methods uh, that can be used or can't be used, the legality of measures, the legality of uh, any other aspect that, uh, that uh, is involved uh, in the preparation level. And once there is a uh, higher level uh, operation, then the plan is translated into a, opera into a, a command, an operational command. So we are involved <coughs> in the operational command, making sure that it, is, uh, that it incorporates the law into it. So the idea is not to have a legal annex, but to have it inside the, the, the command itself. Uh, and uh, and then still be there with the with the with the commanders and consult them on the decisions themselves. Not every decision, but many decisions uh, or most decisions uh, would go also. There would also be a legal advisor uh, there. So that's the framework. Now the question, and I think it was raised very uh, strongly here. Uh, uh, what what role does the law and the legal advisors have, and what should it have? Uh, in these aspects, and uh, is it uh, and and how does it work uh, in a democratic society? And then I will say again, how does that? I think uh, is it relevant uh, in teaching the law to students? And I come back in the end to my law days as a lecturer also. But to start with the, the legal advisors. First of all, uh, since I was also involved in the peace negotiations and both in the armed conflict aspects, so I think the first points that were raised here uh, by uh, uh, Advocate Jabarin is uh, really uh, uh, refer to the basic uh, think tenets of the conflict here. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that make it so complicated is that it is not just a conflict on ending the occupation, which is difficult in itself, but it's a much deeper conflict about uh, uh, the identity of the country. And we hear it here very strongly. And yes, there is uh, inherent a, a tension between the democratic values of the country and its Jewish identity. And this causes a, a, a tension that, uh, and, and that's why the creation of the state, <coughs> the 
1948, <coughs> not just the occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in 1967, uh, other the, the basic, and some would say even going back to uh, uh, the Balfour Declaration and the mandate, but uh, are, are they, uh, w where the conflict begins and uh, will have to somehow end. And that's what makes it so difficult. And here, I think, uh, if we look at uh, this uh, national identity, uh, is uh, where uh, uh, the law, if we try to, to solve it by the law, to try to solve the issue of the refugee issue, which is part, again, of this feeling of uh, injustice that was created to the Palestinians by the creation of the State of Israel. This is a, a, a genuine feeling of, a, of a wrong that has been done, uh, that has to be corrected, but if it will be corrected uh, as they wish, it will for the Israeli, Jewish Israelis will be the end of the notion of a, of a Jewish yes. state, so that makes it so difficult, and here we even see, uh, oh, it's even deeper than that, because even the Israeli uh, uh, Palestinians uh, that have Israeli citizenship uh, uh, it's, 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 not, it's an unsolved issue. So I think here uh, what we have to uh, somehow uh, acknowledge is that the law, um, and it's always difficult for lawyers to acknowledge that, is not always the solution for everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and going to and trying to, to find the, the legal solution uh, is uh, many times also counterproductive. So it's, it's the same especially if we go to the essence of the conflict, but also if we go, uh, and it's not that we can't make the good argument why there's no right of return or there is a right of return. I'm just saying not that the law won't solve it. Um, and uh, uh, even if we go again to the 1967 uh, conflict, and again the question of the occupation and the legality of settlements, not the legality of settlements, yes, it's, a, it's an issue. There's, of course, the law there is very relevant, but it's, uh, uh, in essence, won't be solved again by the law. Or if there will be an attempt to solve it by the law, it will not lead to a peaceful resolution of anything. Uh, and it's not, uh, um, there's a good reason why, for example, the issue of settlements is part of the issues that will be negotiated, should be negotiated in the permanent status agreement. And even when the Palestinians and the Israelis did come close to making agreements, there were always also the ideas of land swaps. Not all settlements necessarily were uh, to be evacuated. There would be corrections in the border, which means that it's not uh, that the, the law, okay, it's now the, the begin, the starting point is everything is illegal, that's the starting point, everything has to be evacuated, but no, if you want to reach an agreement, maybe we'll have to have some kinds of compromises and not go by the, the stick to the law, and that makes the whole debate, or the whole legal debate, I think, interesting, um, theoretically, uh, not very uh, practical and not very useful, uh, in, an in any attempt to solve uh, the conflict, because uh, solving the conflict re needs a, requires a flexibility, um, and uh, the law there should be working more like a, as a lawyer, more as a, someone trying to make a business deal and finding a, a how to a, a find something that both sides can live with, than to a, as a judge that has to say who's wrong and who's right. So. Coming back to the second point, the IHL, which is uh, my focus, uh, was my focus on the second half of my, uh, of my uh, military service. Uh, I think, again, we have to uh, differentiate between uh, what we can expect the law to do and what we can't expect to do. So if we expect, and the fence as an example, that the law, or through the law, uh, we will uh, 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 prevent Israel from defending itself, because let's say we will accept the notion that a defense or any security measure uh, is in itself illegal because the occupation is illegal, or that, for example, the uh, uh, any use of force is unlawful because all we have here is uh, civilians uh, uh, that are uh, uh, that are uh, 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 protesting. Uh, I'm not talking now only about the process, but in general against the occupation. Uh, so, in general, any kind of use of force. Uh, would be excessive because it's a, it's a kind of, uh, you have to use a law enforcement uh, paradigm in all cases, then we won't get forward anywhere because that's something that the state and the commanders uh, and uh, the, the life uh, won't, won't sustain because that would mean that you really, uh, coming back to the first quote of Emmanuel Gross, would uh, mean that the, uh, it's a, uh, you said that it's, uh, you said that Aaron Barak, that it is not, uh, I don't remember what the word you said, but I what stuck is usually it's not a suicide pact. Uh, so uh, you are still, you need to have these, uh, now the second part is, okay, if you acknowledge that you do have this right to use force or this right to security measures, 
uh, how, where, where should there be the limitations? And here I think the law has a very important role to play. Um, and here it's really the challenge of the legal operational, uh, of the operational legal advisors uh, uh, to have their impact. Because if the impact will be to say anything you want to do, any use of force is illegal, you will become irrelevant. If on the other hand you look at it not as a, a, a black and white yes and no, but uh, understand the complexity, and that's why the legal advisors also have to have an operational uh, background, uh, I don't have an operational background, but at least an understanding courses, some even have an operational background, to understand the, the complexity, then you can, within understanding the, the complexity of the situation, uh, uh, see how you can uh, uh, implement laws in a way that uh, fulfills the, the main aim of the of IHL, which is uh, to protect civilians as much as possible, or to minimize harm to civilians, um, and when you have that goal in mind, uh, yes, I'm finishing. It's it's a, it's a, a you you apply the the the, the, the rules accordingly. <coughs> so since uh, uh, Emmanuel opened with a quote, I'll end with a quote, uh, and mine is of Mayor Shamgar. Mayor Shamgar was the president uh, of the Supreme Court, but beforehand he was also uh, uh, the MAG, the Military Advocate General, and he wrote in his book uh, Shamgar: A Way of Life in an interview. The military lawyer must look for a correct legal solution that serves the military purpose. If it is found, the military can use this path. But essentially, if such a solution is not found, the military lawyer will give a clear answer which discards unlawful solutions. The answer to the query must always be a legally correct response. But it is useful if it is given by someone who knows the military and understands the essence of the problem from all its aspects. This should be clearly stated. A military lawyer is not someone who is forced to provide an affirmative, affirmative solution <coughs> at any price. He, I would add, or she, must be careful from being dragged to a flimsy solution, since by that <coughs> he or she might fail those seeking her advice. However, if a lawful option can be found, she must bring it to the attention of those seeking the advice. I didn't get to the pitch teaching part, but maybe in the discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that all the Israelis have so much to say now, but we'll start from our guests, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, be glad to uh, uh, hear remarks or questions. Go ahead. So I'm about to make some very provocative remarks. Mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of time in Israel. I've taught at Haifa. I've taught conflict resolution here. I think you may like this. Um, I'm alive uh, in part because my parents survived the Nuremberg Laws. And when I got my chair at Georgetown, I gave a very provocative chair lecture, which began, I'm about to get a chair in law, and I do not believe in the rule of law. Anyone sitting in this audience who is either the product of American slave law, South African apartheid law, or the Nuremberg Laws, knows that the rule of law has been used in many historical examples never mind Roman law and the beginning of slavery or early forms of slavery, the law oppresses just as much as it <coughs> frees. So I'm a law professor, and I start from a perspective of a critique of the rule of law. So I want to put that on the table. There is a lot of over-referential respect for the rule of law in our so-called democracies, which are not democracies, none of them. I don't, I'm, I'm being very provocative. I'm just going to make four provocative comments that I hope will facilitate a conversation. Um, so that's, um, that's number one. I question the rule of law um, when I teach. Um, I'll make a teaching point second, which is at my, I, I'm also the founder of a new law school. I went to start a new law school, and one of the things that we did was we put international law in the first year curriculum, curriculum so that our students in narrow Southern California would be citizens of the world. And I teach international humanitarian law, and I teach the wall. And I teach Arn Barak's two decisions from the Israeli Supreme Court on the legitimacy of the wall, very relevant in Southern California. Um, so my teaching point is uh, ways to get at this stuff by looking at comparative law. Expert over there, David Nelkin, looking at borders contested in the world, Northern Ireland, now the European Union, where is their border going to be? Uh, I've spent some time in Northern Ireland, too. Very big issue at the moment. What is going to happen to the European Union border? It may not be violent now, but I think it could get violent again. I was just in Belfast recently. It could get violent again. And there has been many workshops on the Israeli 
um, uh, Palest Palestine disputes and Northern Ireland. So looking, uh, getting students, and I do that in my first year classes, and you know, I, I did it here a little bit, and I'm sure people do it here too, to understand both the specificity of Israel and Palestine, which are very specific, and also the extent to which these are human problems, borders, walls, conflict. How do we police ourselves? Um, and so um, uh, one of my mentors, who was a Gestalt therapist many years ago, said the best way to teach things sometimes is to get the focus off the focus and look at it in other places. So um, when you have to confront uh, all the instances of injustices here, let's take a look at how they've been dealt with in other places. Provocative point number three. I am as critical of the U.S. Constitution because I hear you being critical of the basic law. I don't know how many Americans know that Israel doesn't have a written constitution the same way we do. Constitutional uh, <clears throat> theme here created in part by a man I respect deeply, my friend Aaron Barak, uh, comes from uh, the base, two basic laws um, and the interpretation of those laws in the Supreme Court. John Marshall to Americans, that's Aaron Barak, who, who made a lot of the constitutional theory through uh, Israeli decisions working with others. The American Constitution set up a totally unequal system. There were slaves. They were two-thirds of a human being. It took over... Three fifths. Three fifths. Sorry, I do that all the time. It took over a hundred years uh, for uh, a civil war to make some of them citizens, that is, the males who were uh, released from slavery, not the women, either black women or white women or any women who got to vote for many, many years after that. So uh, it's very charged here, uh, as it is in lots of places in the world. One must remember that the so-called democracy of the United States took at least 200 years to get to this point, and it certainly isn't equal now. Um, so the notion that constitutions use words to describe equality is a very serious work in progress, and I am just as critical of the US Constitution uh, for what it has and has not accomplished. Um, this is a tough teaching problem. Because when you have law students, um, anyone who's a law professor wants them to believe in the rule of law. So who wants to find them like me who's criticizing it? Um, uh, and I think uh, if you give your students any sense of respect, they have to grapple with those two ideas. Um, I did it today on purpose. When I teach, I often wear black and white. Um, because the idea is, uh, as F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, something about the idea of intelligence is ability to hold two, I two conflicting ideas in your head at the same time. And that's what this is all about. How can Israel be Jewish and, de and democratic? Um, I think ultimately it's not going to be able to, or, or at least you have to redefine those words. So um, uh, I want to problematize rule of law, constitutions, equality, and realize that the positive part of human life is that we change all of these things over time. So a law school like Haifa that has the advantage of being 30% Arab is a place where you can be the crucible of changing these ideas and questioning legal categories. That's what keeps me in law teaching. I could have retired a long time ago. Um, and what's interesting to me is the plasticity um, of these categories and how they can be changed, but they can only be changed by questioning them and being critical of them. So I do a lot of what you're describing in the United States. I should you know, come over here and do more of it here. So um, the fourth thing I'm going to say is because of my skepticism about law, I, I don't think I'm here for this reason, but I, as I told some of you, I have for about 11 years been working with a local group called the Parent Circle Family Forum. How do you say it in Hebrew? Um, it's totally non-legal. This is one, there's zillions of the many um, grassroots peace groups. But this is a peace group that has over the years brought um, everyone, as in the military, every family that has suffered a loss um, mm -hmm. together to do okay. describably where you're describing. Your, we get together, usually, I've been mostly in the West Bank, but some work here to bring people together who've experienced it. There's no law discussion at all. And in 2008, when I was here, uh, as part of a very high-level delegation of the American diplomats, not the main negotiators, but the second tier advising the negotiators, I, I experienced what I describe as the vertigo that I feel whenever I'm here, which is that there's a lot of rhetoric at the top, um, and everybody uh, and you've participated in it, you know, everybody can draw maps of where the land exchanges are going to be. The bizarre thing about peace here is that I think there is a framework um, for the ultimate solution, and, and so people kind of know around the margin, I mean, the right of return and Jerusalem are complicated. People sort of know what the outcome's going to look like, and nobody can get there. 
And I've decided in my work um, that although I enjoyed being up here in the top, I actually preferred working on the ground. Uh, because in those moments when there is sharing, not only of commonality, that everybody's lost somebody, but difference. So um, I'm a mediator. There's a, there's a similar, I think, um, simplistic conception of mediation that when we get together and have these dialogues and these talks, we're going to find our commonality and come together. That's only part of it. We also have to acknowledge our differences. And the Palestinian story is different than the Israeli story. And in my view of all of this, um, they both have to be told. Um, and um, the final thing I'm going to say, I often say very provocatively, um, when I talk about this outside of Israel, um, the resonance in the United States and Australia and South America, places where I teach, to the extent that we're fighting about who was on the land first, um, is not productive. Because if we talked about who was on the land first, Virtually everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people, except maybe <coughs> two million people in the United States, would have to leave the United States, leave mm -hmm. Canada, leave Central America, leave South America, and leave um, Australia. The people who are on the land first are our aboriginals and our indigenous communities, mm -hmm. and most of the rest of us are colonialists, and I say that in class too. So um, we need to find new languages to figure out how to construct um, all the issues in the conflict, I just add the big one, which is what are we having a conflict about? Um, can we live on this, on this very limited land with multiple stories at the same time? <coughs> and realize that there is no one legal principle who got on the land first um, or who is cultivating the land better that is going to solve this. Um, so we need new categories. End of provocative speech for now. Mm -hmm. We'll I have, more. thank you very, very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll have a new uh, clinic so to uh, work with meditation. Maybe we'll take the peace process as, as a project and yeah. we'll yes. solve it. Yes. Yes. Uh, we don't do it in the I first year, but <laughs> probably <laughs> in the next, in, in the <laughs> second year. I did it when I taught mediation <laughs> here. It's close to what the interest Yes. yes. Uh, some remark, another remark from our guest? And well, it's hard to follow what Carrie said, and uh, so I'm just going to offer a few little observations that don't may not be as connected and as well organized as, as Carrie's. Uh, first of all, um, I think that the law schools represented at this table from the United States are law schools that are deeply conservative. Um, they're conservative in superficial ways, such that the professors, the men dress in jackets and ties when they teach their classes. The students, if they're going to have a job interview, they wear a navy blue business suit and high heel shoes. Their hair is combed and pressed. They get rid of their tattoos, no nose rings, no multiple ear. Every, the, it, the, the schools are deeply conservative in terms of how people even dress. And then, although the schools may have on their beautiful brochures that the mission is justice and equality and constitutionalism and human rights, the fact of the matter is that it is well known that 85% of the students are going to go work for a large corporate law firm in New York or Washington or Philadelphia or LA, you know, this, San Francisco, Chicago. This is what we're, we're producing lawyers to work for, for conservative business concerns. That's what we do. We also produce a small number of lawyers who are going to go work for elite public interest organizations, NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, or whatever. And the, but these are also, in a way, conservative institutions, because they also wear blue, navy blue suits and high heel shoes and go to court and, and advocate rights. But there's just something very pr predictable and conservative about, about that group too. So, so here we are, coming from these very conservative institutions, coming to Israel to talk to you about how you can deal with with problems that are that are very very deep that we don't under we barely understand carry understands better than than most um, and so uh, it's to me a little bit ironic um, uh, then just some scenarios so the very first time I taught a law class sorry taught a class in American University I was 25 years old and I walk into the classroom and a white male student stood up in the classroom and asked the following question I was teaching political philosophy. What gives you the right to teach this class? Just like that. What gives you the right to, that's my first introduction to my first day of teaching. <laughs> so it goes from there, right? Um, that was in the 1970s. Uh, flash forward to the 1980s. I'm at Georgetown University. I've been assigned constitutional law class. 
I walk into the classroom, this is the first day of class, I have to teach the Constitution. And I have to say that in this document, black people are defined as three-fifths human beings. The slave trade is said here to continue until 18-something. Native Americans don't exist. What, women can't vote. This is the, so I'm just, I'm just literally teaching what the document says. White male student goes to the dean's office and complains, Professor Allen can't be fair to white people, so she can't grade my exam. All I'm doing is repeating what the document that of which our nation is constituted, they're just saying what it says. But it's seen as heretical <coughs> by a student in a university to um, remind them that American constitutionalism has a very profoundly um, bigoted, racially prejudiced, non-human rights focused origin, right? Just to say it. And actually, there are many stories you can hear of professors, black professors in the United States who were, uh, were um, criticized for teaching the Constitution because the white professors ignored page one, you know, page two. <laughs> they just teach, you know, the First Amendment or, you know, the three branches of government. They don't teach what the Constitution says about the people who occupy <coughs> the, the nation's lands. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, so very conservative. All right, so um, <coughs> now I've grown up. I'm a big girl now. I'm a vice provost, you know. I have all this power and I, you know, help all these. So, uh, so now I'm finding myself, you know, look at me, I'm wearing a jacket, you know, I'm going really <laughs> straight hair today, you know. Yeah. Um, it's lots of style. But thank you, thank you. Um, but, but here's what I'm, what I'm troubled by. Um, I love universities, I love law schools, I think, but I think law schools need to be like this, con this conversation today. This is what law school should be every day. Not um, teaching just what the conservative going to Wall Street students want to hear, and not just what the radical Carrie Minkle medals want to hear, right? But this conversation where all the different viewpoints are on the table at all times. This is what it means to teach the law. You have to teach the politics. You have to teach the history. Mm -hmm. You have to teach all sides. You have to teach all voices. That's what you need to be doing. And anybody who <coughs> says, keep this out of the law school, keep that out of the law school, then they're failing the student, because the students need to hear it all. One last story. So I went to Harvard Law School, and I remember um, being uh, going in to see a professor who had assigned a lot of um, articles beyond the textbook to read. Left-wing professor, someone who believes that law is politics. And I go inside and I say, <laughs> Professor so-and-so, Professor Duncan Kennedy, mm -hmm. Professor so-and-so, um, I read all these articles. That I would like to make an appointment to speak to you. He said to me, Anita, I'm not here to teach you. I'm here to teach the white guys who are going to Wall Street. So as a, as a student of color, I was defined out of the mission of the law school by the progressive, left-wing, hypocrite, white male professor. Yes. yes. So um, you know, uh, I'm imagining the Palestinian law students here at Haifa, you know, being like me. You know, they're like in the minority. And they're, they're so happy to be here. They're so proud to be here, as I was proud to be at, at, uh, at uh, Harvard Law School. But who's there to teach them? Who's teaching them? Who's listening to them? Who's understanding them? Who's embracing them? Because you can imagine how both the progressive and the conservative professors may not really be focused on the needs of that population. But that population so desperately needs to be included. Mm -hmm. But can, we, but can we hear from you, Gad, yeah, what's yeah. happening in the yeah. University of yeah. Haifa? Sure. I, 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 first, we need to thank the comparison between Haifa and Harvard. They both began with H, you know? So, uh, ah, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, so okay. does he uh, the university. I, I, <laughs> just a uh, small remark. Uh, in, in the legal clinics, we, we teach with uh, education clinic, a teacher, and every time we speak about uh, the Arab education system in Israel, and we see how it uh, discriminate uh, when we um, in front of the Israeli usual education system. And one time we brought a guest. It shows the Palestinian uh, guest from one of the organizations. She said she said everything we said normally, which the all the students just hear it and okay, the ear doesn't uh, really matter to them. And when she spoke, I was amazed. 
that all the students, the Jewish students, was like this. They, they were angry about her. And it was not what she said. She was not very critiqued. I, I'm, I'm much more critiqued than her. But mm -hmm. the, the response was very, very different mm -hmm. uh, when she said it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I want to ask Professor uh, Jabberin a question. I find it very interesting and important what you had to share with us. Um, as far as I understand it, I've also been quite often in Israel. Your description from the perspective, which is what you were trying to present, of the members of Israel who are not Jewish, that the law often serves to legitimate, but even when it saves certain situations, makes the law change, helps particular individuals, <coughs> but overall it's effective to legitimate. I think most sociologists of law, in fact studying in most countries the relationship between law and power, would unfortunately often come to that conclusion. And then they would add, but it's better than the alternative, in the sense that you have to ask, what they would say, you have to ask, uh, if this sort of taming of power, this sort of limiting of power, this attempt to transform power into authority by giving something back to the weak is certainly a way of maintaining power, but it's better than power not having any limits on it. So to criticize law for legitimating without saying you know, how you would imagine, then, then, then opens the question. Of, and so that's the, then, then following that, Again, I'm asking hard questions that I thought you, I hope, because I thought you were saying hard truths, hard truths. So the, the next question is, if the alternative is, take the law seriously in what it claims, don't let the law be half lying. You law stand for human rights for everybody, for equality. Keep out the Jewish business that's in there for political, historical reasons, because the law shouldn't recognize this. The law just should be colorblind, should be cultured. If that's the alternative, something like that, put words in your mouth, but if that's your alternative, if you are a genuine fighter for a society based on a, a secularized idea, the, the cosmopolitan liberal idea of individuals standing as human rights, as, as individuals, not, not as members of community, what, what the Enlightenment brought, you'd recognize for some for Jews, Jews as individuals, but not Jews as a group. If, if that's what it is, if it's the Enlightenment vision that you want to happen here, here, look right here in the Middle East, are we sure that saying that honestly corresponds with what is compatible with this part of the world? That I'm not trying to you know, mm -hmm. categorize, but in the sense that there are people brought up in historical and cultural reasons who identify with community, who identify with the religion more than with the Western model of the individual human rights. So that the, the worry I often have is that the difficulty here is whether you should try and be more like other places with their history and culture where you recognize the respect for authority, community, ideology before the individual human right, or whether you should go more towards recognizing individuals as the center of society with their rights, with the danger then, as the communitarian political theorists will tell you, of a society based only mm. on individuals. And I would love to know whether that debate is going on yeah. within the Palestinian circles. Yeah. Uh, the, your uh, first question is becoming the Palestinian question today in the world, in the meaning that uh, until uh, the beginning of the 90s, the only lawyers who were questioning whether to go to court or not mm -hmm. in South Africa. And ANC discuss whether going to the court to you legitimize or not. Now, uh, the, the uh, only Palestinian lawyer in the world today intensively as a group, not in academic discourse, but as advocates, as lawyers, raise this question. So this is why I called it a Palestinian question about uh, legitimacy, legitimation in the law. And I belong to a group that who said we have to continue to go to the court. Now, uh, why uh, you, I disagree with your starting point when we speak about the case of uh, Palestine or the case of Israel, because sometimes I, I uh, use Palestine as geography because it's a disputed area, and I refer to Palestine and all the country, not just West Bank and Gaza, because it's disputed. Sure. So in Palestine, 
uh, this is different because yes and my friend Gadi one of the uh, leading Israeli professors who writes about uh, legitimation and law and in fact he is the first one who criticized me whether I am by going to the court I give legitimacy to oppression not to me or me and also human rights organization now uh, your starting point yes we teach in sociology always that law legitimize the power but today if we compare with democracies uh, what kind of power you legitimize this is a question I agree with you but what kind of power now maybe in US you <coughs> legitimize capitalism you big legit time. yeah big time <laughs> now I am ready to live under regime although I am anti-capitalist to live under regime that I succeed in cases but the only th price just legitimizes capitalism but it's very difficult for me to live under regime that the legitimacy is to kill me that's different when you speak about cases that for example uh, uh, take the wall case it's tackle individual life of people like people they cannot today move from area to area now if I give you example Ramallah far from Jerusalem before the war uh, in car in five minutes today it's hours to reach sometimes you cannot reach it. and people they cannot daily day life it's a problem about killing, I, I mention here because one of the cases that I deal now about opening fires against protesters in Gaza. <coughs> so maybe I will have good decision after a while, after uh, uh, 2,000 already injured and uh, 106 already killed all of them civilians that I mentioned in the case and I will get decision after a while that in the future the army take uh, uh, different measures balancing and here we can teach this as landmark case as beautiful case but what it legitimized until it was decided people were killed when I find the petition in the first week of the uh, protest now we are even oh, almost two months after and it will continue so what kind of legitimacy you give it's a matter here it's not legitimacy of uh, liberal new liberalism vis-a-vis -vis social rights it's like you legitimize using power against daily the life of people to move to leave the country. Two weeks ago, uh, uh, when the events started in Gaza, I found myself in the Supreme Court about case <coughs> that two persons were shot in their legs. And the hospital in Gaza cut for each of them one leg. And the next leg will be cut if they won't move to hospital in Ramallah. So I, I was sure that it's a case. Uh, I will submit the case next day because it's immediate. Will be here and I will win the case. <laughs> the case took two weeks, and during that time one leg was cut. And after two weeks, the court accepted for other person who to save his leg and give decision. So you can say that here, I agree with you. The law save the <coughs> second leg but I found that this is the first case in the history of Israel Supreme Court that the Supreme Court allowed person to leave Gaza it's shock so here what you are legitimized you are legitimized cases that people want to leave because they have cancer they cannot leave Gaza you legitimize cases that student got scholarship from one of your universities from Gaza and the court went allowed. What you legitimize is a problem here. Make it different than what God is speak, what kind of legitimacy of power. Here you, re you reach, in fact, uh, like 
cases in the U.S. Supreme Court when they legitimize capitalism, sometimes I don't feel it in that day. And I, maybe I won't feel that really this legitimizes capitalism until I study it, learn it, and intellectually I will write about it. Here is the Supreme Court, every decision, Palestinians feel it there. So what you legitimize is different in oppression regime than in your liberal capitalist regime. I would love to live in capitalist regime and to legitimize it every day if you ask me to compare whether to live under military regime for 70 years. Now about the second question. Yeah. Why not to go to individual rights? Is that what you're advocating? A yeah. society-based individual rights? Or could you imagine one based more on group yeah. rights? This is, uh, this is good tactics for lawyers uh, to choose cases that they don't tackle the ideology of the state directly. Take individual civil rights cases and by this you put the ideological dispute aside and in fact you ease it to the court to give you a remedy. And the court won't be criticized by the public because it won't be seen as entering ideological matter. So your suggestion is make distinction between individual rights and group rights generally. And I agree with that as uh, legal tactics and I, I do that. However, Israel is very, very radical state in the distinction between individual rights and the group rights. <coughs> you don't have today state that define itself as democracy that even this distinction you cannot live. I am the only lawyer in the modern history who stood before a, a Supreme Court wide by five panel 11 justices to convince them in 2001 to convince them, and almost I lost the case, <laughs> to convince them that list, political list to run to the Knesset by program of asking that Israel should be state for all of its citizens, it's legitimate. The Attorney General of Israel asked to disqualify political party just because it asked exactly what you suggest, liberal, secular state to treat citizens equally. And I stood from nine o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the evening hearing about this case to decide that it's legitimate to run for the Knesset with this platform. I won the case by seven justices against four. But the seven justices that they agree with me, I am finishing, sorry. They agree, they say we disagree with the platform of, of liberal state. We disagree with you liberal state, we disagree with you, secular state. However, here in this case we'll allow it because there are not serious evidence to show <coughs> that this political party work against the core of Israel as Jewish state. This is why procedurally we agree with But in the future, if they will run to the Knesset and they come bells against the law of return and other, we will question that. So this distinction that you make, I this is my strategy. This is what I work daily, but all the time the ideology comes because if this is very, very, very radical state. You have been, this is the only, the longest state that had emergency regulation. 70 years of emergency regulations, which started in Palestine in 1936, Syria, under Assad, before the internal war, uh, their, their emergency regulation was for a short time. South Africa wasn't uh, that long. So this is the, the difficulties to make the distinction. Doesn't mean that I cannot win individual cases. Yes. Others. I would love to have uh, to talk, but I mustn't take more time. Uh, I, I, just thank you very much. Um, OK. Um, we have just 10 uh, more minutes. I'll ask Eric and then Gabi to conclude. Okay. Okay. Can also say okay. I, want, uh, I want to say something. Uh, I feel that uh, at the end of the day we went into <coughs> politics, which I tried really very, very much to uh, go away. Hassan, listen. Our dispute is very, very deep, and it has two sides. Uh, Israel maybe became radical lately 
because of things that happened in the past. <coughs> if you speak to the new generation, my children, uh, that they are, were educated in a house, our house, about liberties, about opening, about accepting everything. You are giving a description that we start from there, but you don't go backward. This is not a right description. I am speaking about law. No, 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 no. And litigation. No, 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 no. But, uh, no, 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 no. You speak about law and you give and facts. Litigation. And you give, no, no, no. We have to be very right and open and honest about what happens. If we would like to come to a solution, each one of us has to accept the truth about his part. You see in Israel a lot of criticism, a lot about, about many, many things. If I would have to defend Israel about what's happening today in Gaza, it would be the easiest part for me to do. When you take a party in the other right that says clearly that the idea and the, the idea of this uh, party that is ruling the, the Hamas is to destroy the state of Israel, and you let people to come and do harm in your border, I think that we're being delicate in our response and what is happening there. So you can speak about the law, how we use the law, how we do the law, etc. Uh, it was not people that, uh, if we're talking about and trying to be honest, that were died there, that were citizens. There were people by the name of the Hamas that were most of them members of the Hamas. So, you know, or if you talk about the wall, why did we build the wall? Did we want a wall? I was in the international department while we were building the wall. We didn't want the wall. But what happened in Israel before? How many civilians, children were killed at that time? So it comes out like when we're speaking about the, the law and the, doing the law, etc., that it's very, it's very, it's going only one two direction. And I think that and people that are sitting here and don't have the background about what happened to Israel, we have to say, and to, I'm not going to do it now because we don't have time to do it. But you should know that uh, when you speak today to the new generation and you come to Gaza, what do the new generation say? The, new gen the, the youngster says, we left Gaza. We took 6,000 people out of Gaza. We left their places to be working in Hamamot. I don't remember how do you do it. Hot, hot houses. We wanted them to work there. They looted everything, took everything. So much money was invested in Gaza. Where did it go to? We find the poverty, etc. By saying this, I'm not saying that I don't think that Israel should do more to correct the economical situation, etc. But wait a minute. Things have from both sides. You have to know it. <coughs> I won't go to the other stuff, but I just, this was, um, okay. Mm -hmm. remark or? So just a quick remark, I, mm -hmm. I think you need to say that, uh, I think everything is also the context. And uh, when you hear a, a, and that's I think one of the issue, the problems, uh, and getting back to the, the, the conference, I was also a professor of law, uh, after I retired, just my personal story is that I was uh, blamed uh, for a, uh, a helping the IDF carry out war crimes, yes. while my position was to, uh, um, as I saw it, to make sure that, war, that the, 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 the law is respected and they're fighting with the commanders all the time, but never mind, that was, that was what was in the newspaper. And then there was a petition that I shouldn't be a law professor because I will, uh, so my first day of teaching law <laughs> was me uh, escorted by uh, a security guards into the faculty, the students were screened before entering and they had to show their names to see that they are interested in the course and uh, that was my first day so but um, and uh, but I think then uh, just to come back to the, the challenge the big challenge is that when you're teaching law uh, and uh, and the cases here uh, are all the time uh, it's the law and and the news and the newspaper uh, is in intermingles. It's all uh, act actualia, as we say. It's all. And uh, how do you, on the one hand, bring it down to really the practical aspects? And I was a practitioner, so of course, I was expecting and still a, a avoid entering all the time into this political, very heated debate. And you have the students and the soldiers and some, uh, uh, from the other side. And, um, and I think that's the main challenge, uh, 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 because I think that if the law is taught especially in a place like Israel, only on the theoretical level we are missing the point, especially IHL and constitutional law. On the other hand, if you go into a, a, 
too much of the uh, exact cases and make uh, the debate the debate becomes between the students uh, and the students in Israel uh, are not not only that they don't come with ties and suits and heels they also don't come with any uh, manners usually <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you come so it becomes a political everybody shouting with everybody kind of uh, discussion and and I think the challenge and in my view was to bring it to the practical to always try to show all the opinions I would try to fight the harshest criticism against Israel and put it there uh, so they read it and hear it and explain it so they don't have only one position uh, and also I have criticism on my own government I would try to bring also the, the, the other side the right which I also don't believe in also to have to be heard the voice there to have all the voices and still to keep it uh, to some kind of academic and not political debate thank you uh, we have three minutes so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. take your time yeah. Yeah. <laughs> take your time, time for three minutes three minutes day, 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 day. don't give me a leg because I am the only one that's sitting here to observe that will do uh, so I'd yeah, like to, uh, to take on, on Hassan a comment which with which I agree that law schools in Israel inclined to be more conservative. If you compare law schools in Israel to, let's say, poli-sci, sociology, even geography. Mm -hmm. so, by and large, there are exceptions, but law schools inclined to be more conservative than some other disciplines. And I think that Kerry and Anita comments also, in a way, explains why. I mean, why? <coughs> law schools probably also elsewhere inclined to be relatively speaking, I'm not speaking about CLS, and, and yeah. inclined to be a bit more conservative. I would like to, uh, as exp from experience of a five years at Dean of the law faculty here at Haifa, who survived to tell a story, <laughs> uh, I would like to make uh, three short comments about our uh, 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 Arab Israeli, Arab Palestinian students in Haifa Law School. So firstly, we always were trying to get over the issue of language. I don't think that this is a major issue. I will end with what I think is a major issue here. Uh, but obviously, we, as the dean, I had to get donations and also state money for allowing us since day one till getting the lawyer license, which is becoming more and more challenging, especially for Arab students because of the language threshold uh, to teach to teach uh, Igbo. Don't forget that unlike minorities in the US, uh, in Israeli system of education, which is unfortunately very segregated, Arabs will study in Arabic, I think, till the third grade, and so we getting students, Arab students, who don't have the same level of Igbo, and we are in the business of language, we are lawyers. So, so this is one issue that as a dean I had to pay attention to. Secondly, I would like to say, I probably experienced as a dean maybe 50 to 60 faculty meetings, and you never forget faculty meetings. I mean, it can be so tedious that you don't forget it. And always we had to take into account, and it always part of our deliberations, what would be the trajectories for our, our Arab students. So I will give you a naive example. Should we want to uh, extend the time of exams from three hours to four hours? So we had to consider what does it mean for uh, our Israeli-Palestinian students. So in each decision, even you know, when I would invite a speaker to the graduation comment to the commencement to the graduation ceremony, uh, what it would mean for our Arab students. So it always is part of the consideration of the faculty. And obviously we have the legal clinics by the leadership <coughs> of Tami and Aran, in which which we and we consider the legal clinics to be a venue in a way in the lines that Irit mentioned of uh, encouraging students to deliver. But in a way we are failing and we have failed. Okay. In what way? That we get students which are uh, victimized, both Palestinians and Jews, by a very protracted and very bitter conflict. Uh, between Palestinians and Jews. Uh, add on that the whole experience of the military occupation of the 1967 war. 
And in this context, I think that as professional academicians, we are scholars, but we are not really, I don't know, mitigators or psychologists. Uh, it's very difficult to overcome. So in a way, it's different than the American experience because it's not only about ethnicity, it's not only about race. We do suffer from uh, racial uh, discrimination, mainly against uh, Palestinians. Um, it's, uh, it's much more deep. It goes to the conflict. And you know, uh, two hours from now, I am going to teach law and social theories. Uh, which is a compulsory course first year, I would have in class about 30 to 40 Palestinians and about 90 Israelis. Uh, and, you know, when they are coming to my class, they read newspapers in the morning about events in Gaza, about events in Haifa two days ago, and I cannot overcome that kind of a threshold. It's not part of my curriculum. It's not what I am teaching. And I think that this is a real challenge. How you are taking advantage of youngsters who are coming to your place. Okay. Both Palestinians and Jewish believe in us. You know, the Israeli Palestinian has so much respect for us as their professors. And I'm not sure that we are taking that advantage and use it, not because we don't want to do that, because I think that we don't have the, the mechanisms and the tools to do that, maybe with the exception of the legal clinics. So, uh, so uh, thank you very much for all for the debate. I, I'm sure you will have uh, a lot to talk about in the, during lunch. Uh, <laughs> Joy is there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So now we are going to lunch in a different place in the university, so you'll get to see more of it.